Hi, everyone. Um, Eric Allen. I teach at Tam Valley Elementary School in Mill Valley, California, Northern California. I think like Cindy, I've lost track on how many years it's at 20, 20 something. <laughs> Happy to be here. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Daniel Hill. Uh, I come from the beautiful bluegrass state of Kentucky and I don't say y'all with every other word. So this is my, uh, going into my 21st year teaching, um, past president of Kentucky Shape and open national trainer. Thanks for having me. Hi everyone, my name is Adam Howell. I uh, teach at R.E. Jewell Elementary School in Bend, Oregon. Uh, again, like many of you, I'm kind of blurring my, my teaching years uh, together, 12 or 13 now, and I am the past president of Oregon Shape and happy to be here. So we, as committee, we want to thank all of you guys, panelists, taking your time out of your day to help us with this stuff. It's pretty awesome to get such a wide variety of people on here with us. So the reason we're doing this today is because phys ed, as we know, it is kind of been turned on its head lately with all the stuff going on in the world right now. So this is our time to kind of talk and discuss, brainstorm, share ideas, bring points up that I'm sure not, we're not the only ones thinking about and considering. So Cash is gonna start sharing first about some stuff he's done and we'll just kind of let the conversation go from there. Awesome, thank you, Jessica. First of all, thank you for having me on here and welcome everybody from all around the country. It's so great to be able to present in this EPW uh, conference and uh, it's just an honor to be here and whatnot. So uh, I really looking forward to the fall just as an opportunity and not an only an opportunity for us, opportunity for community families and staff, just here, here's a chance to look at how we can grow as individuals and how we can get better and really what we've learned in the past and how, how we're gonna have to completely adjust our teaching in the fall or whatnot. So I wanted to share three tips with y'all as far as in classroom or in the gym setting, what you could possibly do depending on your situation and how you could modify that based on what I say. So one of the first things is before even the students come into the gym is how are they gonna enter the gym? Um, and cause that's gonna look different now. You know, some of you may just let them come in or you may have had some, may have had a, some sort of signage that they had when they came in. So one of the things you can do, especially if your gym's gonna already be set as far as how you're gonna have it set up as far as equipment. For example, if you're gonna be using spots or tape or cones or hula hoops six feet apart from each other, I would recommend I would be using tape just because it could stay on there a little bit longer permanently so you're not having to put it out every single time. But one of the signs you can put out as kids enter the gym, whether it's on your, if you have a, a projector and a screen or if it's when they come in, if it's a poster board or whatnot, is have a sign for them, letting them know what to do. Because this is gonna really help you save that extra step when they're transitioning from in the hallway, coming into your classroom or the gym. So if you can have that sign or something on the projector, so when they come in, you don't really have to say much, they know what to do. Obviously you're gonna practice this at the beginning of the year, but it's just gonna save you that time as they are coming into the gym. So that's one of the things I wanted to cover as far as entering into the gym. And any idea you can have, whether it's a poster, a piece of paper, a screen, a whiteboard, think about stuff, that resources you have on your campus that's gonna help you with that. And secondly is when they're at their location or their spot, um, one of the, especially if you're a campus that likes to work on skills, which I hope you are, is self-guided progressions. And these are gonna be really, really helpful because the kids are gonna be actually doing the work on their own as long as you have these progressions listed or shown somewhere. So for example, if you have a, a screen, a big screen, you can list these progressions on the screen where the kids can come performing the skill with whatever equipment you feel comfortable using, they're able to progress on their own. So what is the advantage for the teacher here? The advantage for the teacher here is now you are able to walk around. You're not having to model that in front of the entire class while they're doing it. You're actually going around able to assess the students and how they're progressing on their own. And if they have questions, they're still safely in a spot and where they can ask them and you can, you can answer the questions for you. So self-guided progressions are a big, big, I would highly recommend those if you're thinking of ways on how to perform skills or demonstrate skills in your classroom, try it out with one, even if you have to substitute equipment or even with no equipment, see how you can do that and see how that works for you. And the last thing I wanna cover real quick is a cooperative activity. I know people are wondering, how can we do cooperative activities in a social distance setting? So one of the ideas I, uh, I've done in the past where 
let's say you're using hula hoops. A lot of them are different colors and they have, you have the students on different hula hoops. You'll want them, if you call two or three different colors, if you have, depending on the class size of your class here, you'd have them move to a different colored hula hoop that a student is not in. Now, what do they have in their hands? A piece of paper and a list of questions that you would come up with and they would have a pencil. And the question, and this is how they're gonna get to know each other, especially at the beginning of the year. You're like, find someone who likes country music. Find someone who went swimming this summer. Find someone who's born in a different country. So you would list these questions. And maybe on the last question, you have a student come up with one that they wanna find out. So if you have them moving safely, once they get into their, let's just say hula hoop, they're gonna find someone different that they haven't asked, six feet apart. They're gonna ask them a question. Hey, do you like country music? If they say yes, they find out who their, what their name is and they write their name down. So it's just a little safe cooperative activity you can do. I just said hula hoops because they're different colors. If you have spots, if you have different colored tape that you can use six feet apart. Uh, I'm hoping nobody has more than one or two classes coming in at one time. I'm really hoping for that. I'm, I'm usually you have six, so I'm hoping that number gets reduced. So that may look a little different for me. So I just wanted to share those three tips with y'all. So entry into the gym, self-guided progressions, and then a cooperative, possible cooperative activity that you could participate, your students can participate in. So if you have questions for me, I'll be looking at the Q&A and I'll be able to answer that for you. Thanks guys, appreciate it. Thanks, Cash, that was awesome. Yeah, that is the biggest fear for us. So many phys ed teachers have these huge class sizes and that's a legit concern. So uh, Cash also mentioned the Q&A part. Uh, for those of you guys that were not on before, we are using the Q&A feature of the webinar down at the bottom of your screen. And for you guys to be able to ask the panelists about kind of what they're speaking about now or what they already have, and then we can respond back to you that way. If you go to the chat part of it, that's for kind of more of the laid back chat, kind of the not so focused on the actual presentation part of it. Because um, I'm afraid if you put a question in there, it's going to get lost because there's a whole lot of people talking in there, which is excellent. That's kind of the point of this. Um, if you have not introduced yourself yet, please go ahead and put who you are and where you're from into the chat part. It's great to get to see where everyone's from and kind of who we're talking to. Because again, all we see are each other here on the panelists. We don't get to see the attendees during the webinar is set up. So this is our chance to interact with you guys. Um, so Cindy's gonna share some stuff here and yeah. All right, so um, I just was having a hard time figuring out what to pinpoint as far as what to share. Um, right now in our district, they're still deciding on what model they're going to adopt, unfortunately. Um, they actually have a board meeting tonight and as staff members, we have not heard yet from our union what that model is that they're proposing. So it's likely that I won't find out until tonight or maybe tomorrow. We are very hopeful, I think the majority of us, that it goes virtual to begin with because we are a very large district. We're second in the state. And um, our cases, for those of you following all the states, there's definitely a spike in the cases and so that I think has us very worried. So everything that I've shared with you is all virtual and these are things that I did in the spring. For those of you that are Google people, um, I use Google Slides for all of for all of my lessons and um, I, you know a little disappointed that there wasn't the engagement that we wanted overall but I think that has to do a lot with the expectation wasn't there of our students. We're hopeful that if we do start off the year virtually that that piece changes and we're holding the students a little bit more accountable. So I have to say that um, for me as a professional, it was a huge time of growth. Um, and I say that in a, a technical way because I've always enjoyed technology, but I've never felt like I had the time to really sit down and fiddle around with it. And I'm sure many of you can can relate to that if you have families and, and children who are involved in different things. And so this really forced me to kind of take a look at my teaching and do some of the things that I would take notes on when I go to different conferences. And so I really got familiar with um, many of the Google products. I learned all about incorporating emojis, GIFs, um, animation, making them my own. So these little quadrants here are um, linked to a slide that just gives you kind of a snippet of each of my lessons. So um, some of the ones that were most popular were like the safari adventure and the forest adventure, those sorts of things. And I did that a lot with the K through two students. Um, lots of steps involved, but I think like anything, when you 
put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into something, you feel really proud of the finished product. And those were the lessons that my families, my students, and my colleagues were you know, really chattering up about. So I was really pleased with that. I would get pictures of my students sent to me from their parents um, telling me how much they enjoy those sorts of lessons. So I sent Jessica a folder of my online lessons that included the actual lessons in the Google slide format. So you just need to open it up, make a copy and make it your own. But I, I tried to do, I tried to find ways to connect with the students as much as I could being um, virtual, right? So I tried to incorporate pictures of myself, um, the gifts when I learned how to do those, they were of myself doing the activities and the um, safari adventure in the forest one, you'd see a picture of myself in the bottom right corner with some music and I'm kind of leading them through. It's kind of like a story, right? And I'm doing the actual activity in the bottom right corner with the timer. Um, I also felt important to do a mindful minute that I had learned from a classroom teacher um, my first year of teaching in that in that district and um, we would do it together in the gym as a closure so it wasn't something that was unfamiliar to them so each morning I would come out <laughs> my husband could attest I'd make him come out here and videotape me probably 50 billion times before I was happy with the one that I liked and so I would teach the mindful minute or film the mindful minute um, in my yard on a walk um, I would just try to connect so that they were seeing my face and hearing my voice and I would lead them through it. And so that was something that I included in every single one of my lessons. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I've done. You see the gifts. I have some of my daughter playing soccer. Um, I use that with some of the skill based lessons that we did with the upper grades. And then I also included the waters of the world and the active across America lessons that were also Google slide ones and those were intended for like fourth grade and up and I've had people comment on Twitter from high school that they could see themselves using this. So most of the things I try to do are all cross curricular. It's just something I'm super passionate about. It's something that um, uh, we present on as a group with the Fab Four and um, I'm just always trying to find ways to kind of, you know, knock down those silos of academic content areas. So um, feel free to ask me any questions specific to these to these particular lessons in the Q&A. And like I said, I put a lot of them in the folder for you to have access to and change. But with that, have any more questions, just holler at the end. So the folder that Cindy's talking about, I will be sharing that out shortly. Um, it's going to be a link into a Google Drive folder that has everything that we are sharing on the screen today, as well as that folder from Cindy. Um, so all that will be out to you. I'll, I'll drop into the chat in a little bit here. So now we've got Jonathan, who's going to be sharing about some stuff. Some stuff indeed. Thank you, Jess. So what I'm going to share with you today is what I um, did for my distance learning experience um, in the spring. And everything I'm I'm going to share with you is is um, was created because of my situation. So what happened was is that the Friday that we got the announcement that our schools were going to be out for two weeks. It was two weeks at first. We were tasked by our administration to create something to send home with the students. Luckily, I had a a really nice break. Um, on that Friday and I was trying to think, you know, what did I really want the students to go home with and, and create? Um, and so I came up with uh, an enrichment calendar and my enrichment calendar, which, which Jess has been, which is, which is being shown right now is right there on the left. And since my school population, um, I, I taught K to, K to five, and we did a lot with our PE website and with technology. So um, my school population was very comfortable with accessing information online through the PE website. So I hosted a enrichment calendar where each day the students had the opportunity, opportunity to participate in a physical activity, a jam in a minute, and also to review a skill that we had done earlier in the year. So I wanted that physical activity 
but I also wanted some type of of um of content knowledge also. And this was before we got the mandate from our county of what exactly the rest of our our distance learning experience for the rest of the year would would look like. So once the county mandated that we create video lessons for the rest of the year to reach our students, then I continued to create the, um, the enrichment calendar, but it just simply served as a supplemental resource. So the students would, um, would, would complete it if they wanted to. And then I, I added a little Google form on the P on the PE website, just, just as like an interactive piece so the students could share with me what they did and also how it made them feel. So for the second part of the virtual learning experience, so the first part being the enrichment calendar, the PE video lessons, I really tried to be very intentional and direct with what I wanted to do because we could create live lessons where we would have our classes on Zoom and we'd have 30 minute periods um, every other Friday. But because of the way that the, the timing worked with the, the regular ed classes and, and my school also had music and art, we were kind of shoehorned in the, in, into the specific time. And so teaching live lessons to me wasn't really a, an efficient way so I created um, 20 to 25 minute lesson videos and each lesson video included a jam a minute to start, the objective skill, skill exploration, teacher directed portion, individual practice and activity that the kids did an on-screen assessment and also opportunities to take their learning even further. So I created movies through iMovie where I I talked over or I, I recorded myself with my iPad and the students viewed that video on Google Classroom where I, where I posted it. And then on Google Classroom, I also attached a Google form for an assessment. It was usually a one to two minute, I'm sorry, a one to two question assessment based on what was in the video. Now, one of the parts that I regret that really should be a point in the fall is the social emotional learning piece. I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish that at the beginning of the lesson videos that I would have added a check-in or some type of activity where the students could access their feelings and just reflect on how they were feeling. And then I would also reflect on how I was feeling uh, to, uh, to create that, to create that connection. Um, if you're interested in seeing in seeing the lesson videos, they're all YouTube links, um, and they will be on the on whatever Jess is sharing out. Uh, lastly, the last part of my my um, my virtual learning experience was I wanted to make sure that I created a way for the students to still see me and talk to me. So I I had office hours, which it was a set, set time each week that the students could log into Zoom and ask me questions or interact with me. Um, it was really funny where it, it turned out not even being about the content and the lessons, but the students just wanted to come and talk or see their classmates. Um, just, it was a really fun time, which surprisingly I learned that I needed also, you know, to create, to, to connect with my students. and. I also uh, lastly had an end of the year meeting where I just met with each grade level and provide like a, a, a mini wrap, wrap up of our, of our um, school year. And also gave another chance for the students to see me and interact with me. And it was, it was very comforting for me, especially with my fifth graders who I would never teach again. Um, they, they got to see me, we got to talk and it was really, it was really accessing that emotional piece. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to shoot me, shoot me some questions in the, in, the, in the question and answer section. So again, I know we, I'm looking at participant numbers and we have had quite a few more people hop on. 
So um, for those of you guys that have hopped on a little bit later to give, make sure you guys know what's going on, we are using the Q&A section down at the bottom for questions going directly to the panelists that you would like answered either while they're talking or shortly after. Uh, we are asking you guys to drop into the chat part um, a hello of who you are, where you're from, so we can kind of familiar, familiarize ourselves with who you are and who we're talking to. And then uh, later on during this, once I'm done screen sharing everybody's stuff, I will be dropping in the link to all the stuff that they're talking about. So if they are talking about um, some of the stuff that's in the folder, you guys will be getting that link later on. I just can't do all that and share all the screen all at once. So that'll get dropped in towards the end of this. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to Erica. So Erica is a long time EPEW family who's getting pushed out of her shell. And we're so glad that she's sharing her wisdom with all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Um, yeah, so, you know, I just want to share what I did um, over the last three months during our virtual distance learning. Um, some of you are, you know, pretty great at the technology, and I'm going to admit the technology for me was very difficult. So the learning curve was, um, was hard. And our district was a little late in telling us what platform or the platforms change. So we were trying to figure out which platform we we're gonna to use to push out our lessons. So um, we ended up doing, um, after we did some training and then um, ended up going with a Google site that I created in each one of our PE teachers had a tab and we embedded our lessons there and we did the Google slides. So um, this was, the way that we pushed out our lessons and um, it worked. We had a link that we get, gave to our classroom teachers and it learned, lived live in their, um, in their lesson. So they wanted their students to actually click on it each week. Um, the, again, the technology, I, I'm not a big dance person. <laughs> um, so I had to reach out and I was like, of course, I'm gonna go to Melanie. And you know, Melanie's amazing. So I used her YouTube videos. And I challenged myself to use, um, learn something new with technology each week. So me was just embedding a YouTube video. And so I went and I used her dance play and I try to personalize it the best I can. So I did, I had a lot of pictures of, because I met her at Kaferd and EPW, so was able to see her at Kirsten School in Santa Cruz. So just that was one of my um, first challenges was getting that YouTube video up. <laughs> Um, again, trying to personalize it. I, my, my students know that I go to the gym each day before I see them and I'm teaching them. So I was trying to incorporate um, pyramid workouts. They know about those outdoor workouts. I try to put in pictures of that's a hill that I did hill sprints. I challenged them to do some hill sprints to where they lived. Um, some of the units that we did uh, in the past were bowling. I try to use anything that um, we can modify. You know, I knew that they weren't going to have the equipment at home. So it's like, all right, we did juggling. They love that. We did bowling. What could they use? We did, you can use handkerchiefs. You can use socks to juggle. You can use the socks to bowl. So definitely touched on that a little bit. Of course, I went out to the social media and I used, I found, YouTube, Get Kids Moving, PE Specialist, they have great um, visuals to use. So I did a, a balance yoga unit. May was May the Force Be With You, really just trying to get, get my students to view our lessons. That was tough. Um, here, Minute to Win It. Quest to Park, this is an EPW favorite. We did some great minute to win it challenges. And again, really trying to, cause we didn't do any live teaching. And so when we were with our Zooms with our classroom teachers, I was like, we're gonna do some minute to win it videos, you know, trying to entice them to come to um, check out our, to check out my lessons. Uh, Derby, a lot of you guys know that, that um, of this one. And we have some great visuals that I used definitely for, the, um, for this lesson. Open, Shape, Kaferd, all of these great resources. I definitely went out and I used a lot of their information, which was amazing. And I'm super grateful that it was all out there because I could not have done it on my own. 
This one, I, I totally apologize if there's anybody out there that I got this idea from, I can't remember, but this was a great um, activity. Again, I didn't have any, um, I just assumed that they didn't have any equipment. This was a DIY, let's, if you have some cups, the Rubik's race was really fun to do. And of course, I always try to incorporate some kind of fitness in it with any of the challenges. Uh, this one in particular, I was excited because I actually had a parent who sent me a picture of her husband and her, um, one of my students doing this together. And I was like, yes, somebody viewed my video <laughs> and they're doing the lesson. So this was um, a great activity. This one, EPW again, you know, these are the resources that th I learned this a long time ago and we're used to doing our hand Rochambeau, but we, this one I learned where you can use your body for the Rochambeau. So uh, each day for this one, I had them learn about a healthy habit and they were to Rochambeau me each day. And then each, and if depending on if they won, if they tied, if they lost, the next video, they would do whatever exercise um, that I was doing. And this one, it was a big challenge. I had 21 videos for the whole week um, for this for this unit. And I'm super thankful because I did use, um, I had a colleague, a couple colleagues that I would talk to regularly. Shout out to Maria, because I know you're watching, and Allison, who helped me. Um, we would talk every day and we would check each other's videos and, you know, always. The video is not working. <laughs> Last, this one. This one, I know Jessica's gonna laugh at me. So when we met with this first group, um, this round table, Adam was talking and I was like, God, how do I know Adam? And I had to ask him and I was like, Adam, did you do this or that with your colleague? And it was him and I was, I know I geeked out and I'm super embarrassed. <laughs> And I didn't I hope I didn't scare Adam, but I loved this. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. And I did it with a colleague and I shared it with my administrators and my staff and they loved it as well. So I'm just super grateful that there are so many people out there that are willing to share their lessons and then we just personalize it the best we can for our students. And I think for moving forward, you know, we're really going to have to dig deep on you know, what our lessons are gonna look like remotely. And I hope that, you know, we're all safe right now um, this year. And I'm just, I'm a little concerned for the next couple years. And I feel that we really have to think outside the box and rock it and, and show our administrators and our districts and our parents that we can do this remotely if we are gonna be remote. But I'm just super thankful that all of you are out there that we can bounce um, ideas off of each other. So thank you. Awesome. So um, I'm just now checking in with the Q&A because again, when I'm screen sharing, I can't see any of that. Okay, so now we're gonna come on over to Daniel who's gonna talk about things in a little bit of a different light. One first of all, uh, give it up for Erica. I mean, first time yeah, presenting, I mean, no way. No way that was first time. Very good. Very good. She's hooked now. She's hooked. Ah, thank you. So EPW, you got her now. So just for the See, people. okay. It's Golden. not just me saying that. Golden. <laughs> um, that has uh, actually, segue that. a little bit, Erica. Uh, hi, everybody. If you don't know me, my name is Daniel Hill. Um, I'm from that uh, no coast side of the United States uh, in Kentucky. Uh, so uh, I wanted to kind of switch gears and talk a little bit about what is hopefully happening uh, now and maybe happened uh, a little bit last week and hopefully will continue to happen and that's advocacy. Um, yeah, slide there, Van White. You don't need to know any more about me, so click. Uh, so <laughs> what I chose to do on the last couple weeks is start to advocate for what I do and, and what we do as a profession in health and physical education uh, through social media and through this little app called Comic Life. Uh, it is a uh, warning. It is very addictive. Um, I like to be creative, draw and stuff like that. So I get on this thing a lot. I was actually just, I tweeted something this morning uh, just because I get on it and want to create something. Uh, we are in, you know, this new world of COVID trying to figure out how to teach either virtually or hybrid or 
or, or face to face with distance and some of the resources they don't exist. Um, so you got to make them. Uh, this app helps me do that. Um, this is a resource uh, I've created several different things. There's, there's a version I created um, how to check in with my feelings of my students when if you're face to face and distance use this, use their hand, five, four, three, two, one. How are you feeling about this skill? How are you feeling today? Just show me on your hand how you're feeling. And that simple, quick question uh, allowed me to, to ask my students how they're doing. So I'm a comic book geek, I'm, I'm a superhero geek, so everything looks like that. Uh, the visuals that I've created, uh, I wanted to uh, use some of the Shape America resources and um, how all the different different types of education that's going to occur in the fall, whether it be hybrid or face-to-face or -face with distance, all those recommendations that Shape America has put out, I wanted to put it in a one-page kind of infographic kind of visual specific to my students, specific to my building, specific to my district, and share that with the leaders of, of my district and my principal of, of you know, if we go back, uh, still haven't decided yet. Uh, if we go back face to face, it's gonna look like this in PE. Uh, if we are hybrid, it can look like this. Uh, if we're still gonna continue with distance learning, it's gonna look like this. Because what I was hoping with this plan is that they cut uh, me, <laughs> naturally, selfishly, but in, in a global pandemic time, why would you wanna cut health and PE, or the two classes that are going to directly affect and, and improve what we're dealing with right now. Focus on our health and focus on our, 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 on our social emotional learning, all that. So I created these. I uh, highly encourage you to check that app out and check those resources. Um, another tool that Shape America released uh, was this uh, template letter. And you can download it on Shape's website and you can personalize it. Now I did that uh, with a little pessimism. Uh, I didn't think that uh, I'm in the second largest district in Kentucky and you know one of thousands of employees and why would the you know superintendent, why would they, the school board, why would they wanna listen to me? Um, but I, I drafted a letter, personalized it, uh, told them my anxieties and my worries. I also told them about Shape America's resources and every single one of them responded, uh, responded in a positive way. It was very validating uh, in the fact that, uh, hey, they're listening. So uh, shout out to Shape America. Uh, you can get on that, that website and personalize your resources for, for yourself. Um, also a little shout out to uh, Kentucky. Um, speaking of Shape America, if you all recognize that guy over there, that bald-headed guy, uh, uh, Jamie uh, Sparks, the past president of Shape America, he's, he's an advocacy nut. Uh, so he inspires us all naturally. But um, what we've do, been doing uh, with Kentucky Shape is, is Tuesday uh, at two town halls, kind of virtual uh, format, very similar to what we're doing right now. Um, we've invited superintendent. What you're seeing right there is the uh, superintendent of the year. Uh, his platform is health and, and wellness. And to have a, a superintendent or a principal that gets it and then they say it, ups your advocacy, in my opinion. So if you can convince those people and then convince them to convince other people, uh, they, they're, they're helping the, the, the cause. So uh, you can get on our site and check that out. Uh, highly encourage you to do so, but continue to advocate because what we do matters and especially what we do matters now. So I'll jump in the um, uh, Q&A and I really appreciate the, the time. That is a silver lining. And I, and I told this before we jumped on a silver lining of COVID, if I can be positive for a second, uh, to get to do this, uh, if, if, if COVID wasn't around, I don't know that I would have been able to fly out to California to hang out with you all. So there's a little silver lining to all these wonderful uh, online conferences and the learning that has been occurring uh, this summer has been fabulous. So EPW crew, pat yourself on the back. Thank you very much for what you're doing. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, it's definitely been new to all of us here with a whole lot of craziness going on. Yeah, I don't honestly think we would ever have a panel like this if we weren't in this kind of situation. And so far, like, I mean, 
I've already listened to you guys talk a whole lot and that even now I'm still learning more stuff from you guys. So I, for one, am super appreciative of it. Um, so now we're coming on over to Adam to share his stuff here. Thanks, Jess. I'm gonna let uh, Jessica pull up my slide here and I'll reintroduce myself as she's doing that. Uh, my name is Adam Howell. I teach in Bend, Oregon at RE Jewel Elementary. I am the past president of Oregon Shape. And I'm gonna talk to you, uh, I'm gonna take a different approach here. There's been some great resources shared that are practical that you can use in your classroom. Uh, I wanna dive in a little bit deeper and challenge us to think about a bit of a framework when it comes to planning your instructional design this year um, for, distance or virtual learning, or I mean, it could be face to face and in person. And so I have this beautiful photo of the rugged Oregon coast um, as my backdrop here, because I think it kind of encompasses kind of the turmoil that's going on in our in 2020 right now, particularly with COVID and, and all the unrest and, and uncertainty. And so um, I think we can navigate that with some tools and some things to keep at the front of our thinking as we're doing our planning and our thinking. And so the first thing I wanna talk about is when you're thinking about virtual learning or distance learning or you're planning for this year, um, because let's be honest, what we did in the spring, it was not virtual learning, it was crisis learning, it was crisis teaching. We're teaching in a pandemic, it's something we'd never done before. And so, uh, and we're still gonna be in times of crisis is, is the, the virus is what's controlling things right now. So I think, it's important we keep that in mind. And the first thing I want to talk about is going to be really boring, but I want us to talk about our standards a little bit and going back to those standards. And you're probably thinking, oh, Adam, come on, really digging back into your standards. And I think it's important. And I have it up there at the top of the screen, kind of in the sky, because that's our, our, our lofty goals that we strive to, right? Whether it's the national standards that you do your curriculum planning with, or whether you use your state standards, whatever it is, that's, that's our goal, right? And again, we're in a time of crisis where we're teaching in a pandemic. And I think it's really important. I sure didn't look at my standards when I was planning for lessons in March. Um, but I think it's important to go back in and dig in a little deeper and really look at it through the lens of what can I teach that's going to be able to be accessible by all of my students? What can I teach that is something that I can individualize, that's inclusive, that can be accessible by all of my students. And I'm gonna come back and hit that a little bit more with some of my other points, but I think that is really important to this conversation is that we're looking at, we have to look at things differently, right? And just because we've taught certain skills a certain way in a certain environment that we could control for however many years we've been teaching, it's different now. And we are gonna perpetuate opportunity gaps if we're not looking at how can we reach all of our students through designing curriculum through our standards. So I wanna to get to that next point, kind of goes into this physical education versus physical activity idea. And that's something I struggled with in this spring. I taught most of my lessons virtually. I did through Facebook Live and a, and a YouTube channel. And a lot of it, it was very easy to facil facilitate physical activity. It's much more difficult to teach physical education virtually where you're assessing and you have learning targets and all of those things. And part of the conversations we were having in the spring was, oh, that's not physical education. You're just doing physical activity. And there was this, this kind of either or argument or this you know, one but not the other argument. And what I'm gonna suggest to you today is that both of those things are important in a pandemic. And I think we should be naming them explicitly and we should be embracing those terms explicitly. So if you're teaching something that is definitely more on the physical education side of things where you have an assessment and things like that, great, name it as such. But if you're doing something that is more physical activity based, name it as physical activity, call that out. Be clear with your students, be clear with your parents who are watching that this is what this is. Both physical activity and physical education are important to us as practitioners. And, and we want our kids, we want physical activity to be an outcome of physical education, right? So let's not have this either or argument. Let's just be explicit about the language we use and let's name it what it is and embrace it as we do it. The third thing I wanna kind of talk about, and this is coming back to 
uh, the equity and opportunity gap here. And there's, I'm very purposeful about why I have it on that slant right there, because if you see in the photo, there's some houses up on the hill right there. And then there's down below where there's the rocks and everything else. And, and if you had students down at the very bottom of the screen, that's not going to be very equitable as opposed to who the students you have at the very top. Some of those things you cannot control, such as access to technology and things like that. That's going to be what your district's handling on a bigger scale. But I would say that you're going to hear a lot this fall about the achievement gap and I think in a widening. And I think that's the wrong argument or the wrong conversation. I think the right conversation is talking about equity of access and opportunity. And that's where we're going to run into problems with virtual and distance learning. And it's the, going to be the meat of our work. You know, too many times, you know, we create these amazing lessons online and it's an active teacher driver with inactive student passengers where not a lot of your students were engaged with what you were putting out in the spring, okay? So we have to really look carefully at how can we reach all of our students and give them the opportunity to access physical education and physical activity through distance and virtual learning. And I don't have the answers there, but I think everything we talk about and every Thing we plan should be looked at through that opportunity lens and how you're providing access or helping your students get access to what you're trying to teach. And that kind of goes into my last little point here. And it's about the blame game. And we need to be better than the blame game. It's really easy for us for, and it's happened in my PLC this spring where we were getting frustrated as teachers that, oh man, there's such a small percentage of our students who are actually engaging with what we're putting out virtually. And it was a source of frustration. And I think as, as professionals, we need to get past that. And we have to be better than the blame game. You understand, we're still in a time of trauma. That's gonna look very different for everyone, which is why I have that, that little indicator right there out in the, in the surf and with the rocks, because we're in a time of difficulty and a time of trauma. And if your students are not accessing what you're putting out there virtually, don't take it to heart. It's not what you're doing, it's how we're doing it. And I think we cannot blame the student for that. Remember, we've worked really hard in physical education to be inclusive and to individualize instruction. We've really worked hard to change stereotypes of what physical education is versus what it was. Let's not lose sight of that. Let's not lose sight of that and put the blame on students for not being able to access what you're teaching. Let's think we have a whole year to do this, right? Let's slow down, let's be mindful, let's take a breath and let's think about how we can best reach our students and reach all of our students. So that's it, Jess. Just wanted to provoke everybody's thinking. Thank you. So we um, have gotten a whole lot of good snippets of information from everybody. Um, we've kind of covered a whole lot of different stuff. So I'm about to drop the link in right now into the chat that's going to give you access to everything they've been talking about. Um, and then right now I'm kind of pro prolong this conversation a little bit so that everyone has a chance to ask any last minute questions that you guys might have in the Q and A's here. Um, any of the panelists wanna jump in and say a little bit more of something? I, I wanted to ask anybody, please anybody in the, in the chat, um, if your district or your school system is doing uh, virtual, I know some of you all on the panel are, um, have you all thought about how to hold students accountable uh, for that learning when they are virtual? Um, some ways to, you know, make it real and, and hold them accountable for what we're doing. Even if, if they're not engaged, how do we hold them accountable? Uh, so thoughts? I know that um, in the spring attached to each one of my lessons, I had a Google form that I had them fill out. It started out with just getting an idea of how they felt about the lesson or how they felt doing the lesson. And it was just very simple and clicking on an emoji that best described their feelings. And then um, as time went on, I started to try and include some lesson specific questions. But again, because our district wasn't promoting um, accountability and I say that lightly by like we it was we were not they were not able to have their grade lowered so it could only increase and so I mean even with my own children we had to have really good conversations about your mindset re revolving around this concept right that just because you can't you know get a worse grade doesn't mean you shouldn't be trying 
I have three teenagers at home and um, I was seeing that at home and I was seeing that with, you know, my students. So I'm hoping that with some guidance from our district that we could still, I could still have that piece and then it becomes, you know, there's a little bit more accountability. But I, for me and my personal experience, that was the problem is that they knew, the students knew that it didn't matter. They could never log on and it wouldn't matter because they they weren't going to fail or do poorly in a class. They could only increase their grade. So it was just like at home, it was just a lot of conversation about changing your mindset and how you're looking at that. And that's the difference between the crisis teaching and crisis education we had to now in the fall. We as teachers now know what we're getting into at least a little bit more than we did before. I believe students, I know my district was the same as yours, Cindy, where, teacher, where teachers were not allowed to lower any grades. Whereas now they're not starting off with anything. Assessment has to be part of it now. Um, mm -hmm. I know I've seen a lot of good stuff with Flipgrid being used mm -hmm. virtually, which is a pretty easy way. Um, I've heard some teachers bring it down even to second grade and had some success with that. Uh, and it's, you know, with teacher help, it can go even lower, but yeah, there's lots of ways. Jonathan, go for it. If I can add, if you have, um... If you have like the younger grades, like kindergarten, first, second, uh, doing something with Class Dojo, I know they have like a portfolio feature and um, students can submit pictures through Class Dojo to you. So I I had success um, doing that with my with my K my K kids. Just something I'd like to add, Jess. Um, you know, kind of about that accountability piece and I think I would hope I know our district is doing this but I would hope that the district you work in or where you're at they're they're working right now with systems to be able to um I guess reach families that are tough to reach right now e even even more so than, than what we would do normally in a, a pre-COVID right and so I would say get out, like, we need to get out of our silos and realize that you don't have to do it yourself and work with what your district's using. And if you have family advocates, we have family advocates in our school, work with them closely to reach out to those families, work closely. You're probably gonna have to partner or collaborate with the classroom teacher much more um, because they have a direct, a direct link sometimes. And yeah, maybe you're not gonna get 100%, but you can definitely be better, right? And you can reach out and you can do a little bit more utilizing the services that your system is already using. Leverage that when you do so. Um, I just want, I like that you said, uh, mentioned working with your classroom teacher, Adam. I think that was one of the things, even though I knew that some of the students weren't getting on, um, I would reach out to the classroom teacher and say, hey, do you have a different contact number? Is there a way you can reach out to these parents? You maybe have established a better relationship with them than I have. And so working together closely with the classroom um, teachers really helped me out in trying to get them, you know, to log on and, and participate and engage in the, in the lessons. And towards the end, it was like you really changed your own mindset. Like I was very excited when I saw a particular student get on and do a lesson, you know, one that I hadn't been able to reach um, during this whole time. So um, I think that was really good that you mentioned that because I think we can work together and hopefully reach as many students as we can. So we've had quite a few questions in the Q&A. Um, if you guys panelists want to go through and check them out to see if you want to speak to any of them. Um, the question about the speaker, um, reach out to me later individually, and I have a whole lot of research I've done on that one with stuff for that if you're interested, um, but I don't have access to it right now. It's on my other laptop, so. I see some people talking about using Seesaw in there. That one has been great. Um, a lot of people have been using that, I know. Nearpod is something my high school just started, but I'm super unfamiliar with it. So I don't know anything about that one. Just saw a question in there from Jim about teaching with three other people. They seem to be focused on physical activity rather than physical education. Any ideas on how to make them see the light? We all do the same thing at the same time. I would say, Jim, if you teach with three other people, uh, you know, work with them, leverage that, right? Like I, I kind of mentioned when I was talking earlier, let's, let's not 
make this physical activity versus physical education. Okay, let's embrace both and let's take the best of both. And if that's what they're really good at, okay, maybe there's a way we can think outside the box. I don't know what your situation is. If you share the same students, let's think outside the box where maybe they can facilitate some physical activity and you can facilitate some physical education. Let's do, let's do both versus, you know, it's gonna be difficult if someone is looking at just teaching, facilitating phys physical activity, okay, and they're your colleague, it's gonna be tough to get that to shift. So I would say, let's embrace it and leverage it for what their strength is gonna be. And you augment that with what you're bringing to the table. Well said, I'm, and I think right now, if, if in that situation, you're going back you know, to brick and mortar face-to-face -face teaching, you know, you might be under those restrictions of, well, you don't have equipment to, to do those, you know, here's the ball, here's the go be, go be active type lessons. Now you, you're going to have to embrace that more physical education side. So I agree with you, do both. So we've already run over time. We can still continue the conversation, but I am going to put up now um, contact info for panelists that can be going on in the background there while conversation continues by panelists, if you guys would like. So I can't see any Q and A's coming in right now. So other panelists, I'm counting on you guys to do that. <laughs> I do see one question on here and I can just address it quickly. Um, it was a question about uh, technology um, de delivery and their school from Tiffany, their school won't let them provide YouTube videos for anything. So how do you deliver your lessons? That's, I mean, that's really tough, right? That's, and you go to what can you control? And if that's something that your district has on lockdown, um, it's not going to benefit me to answer that question about questioning their, their, their reasoning for locking that down. Right. So what can you do? Well, you can, um, you do have the ability to download YouTube videos. That's a pain. You do have a, a, the ability to house videos in Google drive. You do have the ability to host videos in different, uh, different areas. And if your classroom teachers are using, or your school is using a learning management system, a lot of those systems allow you to embed videos in, in that way. So it's probably going to create a lot more work for you, <laughs> to be honest. But you, if there's something you really liked on YouTube or a video you're creating yourself, uh, you, you do have the ability through other services to be able to deliver lessons with video. Um, I don't know if that's the answer, if that's helpful for you, but, and I would continue to advocate with your district as to the reasoning why they're blocking YouTube when it can be such a powerful tool. I just wanted to chime in real quick. Um, <clears throat> just a note of encouragement, especially for anybody that's new in the profession. <clears throat> Twitter has been a really great place to get some ideas and connect and network with people. And I know it can be a very overwhelming situation. I know I felt that way in the beginning. Um, but if you're just patient with yourself and you're willing to take the time to learn and don't be afraid to reach out to people, I know that I spent so much time um, going back and forth with Becky Fulmer um, and having her help me go through all the different technology pieces. Um, and she was so willing to do that. And I found that to be true with just about everyone I reached out to. They were willing to share their lessons. They were willing to take time to answer my questions. Um, and I just want you to keep that in mind because everyone's kind of in the same place and we're all coming at it from different perspectives. And I also think that what might work for one person, like I really liked Google Slides, but some of my colleagues didn't like that. They wanted to use Google Docs or they're using something completely different and that's okay. You can take the concept of what you're finding on um, Twitter or elsewhere and kind of make it your own and find the platform that is comfortable for you. Um, but I just don't want you to get discouraged because it is it can be overwhelming. And like it was mentioned before, we were crisis teaching and I feel that many of us we're, we're going to be back to crisis teaching if we're going to adopt a different type of model 
Um, but hang in there and make sure that you're reaching out because everyone that I've had experience in dealing with has been very, very helpful. Thank you, Cindy. That's a great kind of closing note for us here. So again, all of the people up here that you see the contact information that's up there, everyone is more than willing to help out and continue conversations after this. I know there's a whole lot more of questions and comments and stuff that we did not get to. Um, there's a lot of people on here with a whole lot of um, questions and inputs and all that kind of stuff that this is definitely just the start of a larger conversation in the phys ed community that I know a lot of people are having in smaller groups. So this was kind of our way of sharing a little bit of it and bringing a whole bunch of smaller groups into one conversation. So thank you for joining us on our first ever EPEW virtual share time. Hope you guys got stuff out of it. Um, yeah, and take care, best of luck, and we'll see you at the social tonight, hopefully. It's bring your own ice cream. I will be there with my banana splits. Can't wait to see what you guys got. Bye.